Hi everyone, this is Intro Stats with Matt Show, and today we're introducing the ideas behind a confidence interval. It's kind of very famous uh, in stats, confidence interval. So today we're going to be looking at the ideas of a confidence interval. What is it? Right? How do we calculate it? Uh, we won't get too much into the calculation today, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of at least introduce it. So, um, introduction to one population confidence intervals is our topic. Um, so the question really is that, that sort of stems all this is how do you figure out a population parameter? So how do you figure out a population mean, uh, a population percentage, right? If you want to try to figure out the percentage of people in the U.S. that have a certain characteristic or uh, the mean average salary of people in Brazil, you know, some kind of population uh, parameter that we're trying to figure out. Well, we learned in the past that really there's two ways to get sort of an at least a halfway accurate population estimate. One would of course be an unbiased census. If I was able to collect data from everybody in the population, I could calculate the population mean directly. I could calculate the population proportion or the population percentage directly from that unbiased census. So obviously if you have an unbiased census, uh, you don't really need a confidence interval. You already know the population parameter. Um, also we saw in our study of sampling distributions, we saw that at least for mean and proportion, when we looked at the center of the sampling distribution, now sampling distribution, remember, was like thousands of random samples or just a lot of random samples. Uh, you calculate um, tons of sample means and you put them all on the same graph. Or if you calculate tons of sample proportions and put them all on the same graph, right, you get, uh, that's called a sampling distribution. And what we found was that if you went to the center of the sampling distribution, it was actually pretty good. It was pretty close to the actual population parameter. So if you were able to get a census, okay, you could probably figure out the population parameter. If you were able to get a, uh, collect a lot of random samples, put them all on the same graph and look for the center, then you could probably get a much better idea of what the population parameter is. The problem is, usually in real life, we can't do either of these things. We can't take hundreds of random samples, and I can't get data from everybody. I can't do a census. So, usually in the real world, all we got is one random sample, if we're lucky. Hopefully, it's an unbiased random sample is what we're looking for. But if we just have a one random sample, what can we do? Right? Well, a couple things. Of course, we've studied this principle, sampling variability, very important uh, principle in stats. Uh, modern stat people often say refer to this as random chance. I kind of like the, the sampling variability term. So this tells us that random samples will usually be different than each other and different than the population parameter. Now, this is something we've studied already. We've seen lots of examples of how this works. Random samples are not the same as population parameters. So I can't just take the sample mean and think that that's going to be exactly what the population mean is. I can't just take the sample proportion and just think that's going to be exactly what the population proportion is going to be. There's going to be what we call a margin of error. There's going to be a difference. So how, how far off we think that could be. Now I actually wrote the definition of margin of error way over here on the board. Um, margin of error is how far off we think a sample statistic could be from the population parameter. So sampling variability indicates that sam uh, sample statistics, like a sample mean, will be off from the population mean. A sample proportion, a per sample percentage, will be off from the population proportion or the population percentage. Margin of error is how far off we think it could be. So we understand in statistics that samples aren't the same. A, a random sample of 150 people is not going to give us exactly what's going on with millions of people in the population. Okay? But there is an important point to make, and this is this point of what we call point estimates. Point estimates create a lot of confusion in the stat, uh, not so much in the stat world, we understand how this works, but in a lot of people that aren't used to statistics, Point estimates can be kind of confusing. So a point estimate is when usually when somebody takes some kind of sample statistic as the estimate of the population parameter. 
so they'll write an article and they don't know what the you know the population mean average salary is so they just take a random sample calculate the sample mean salary and just say that that sample mean is approximately the same as the population mean or that's the estimate of the population mean one issue I have is that a lot of people that write articles especially newspapers uh, magazines things like that do not specify that they just tell you in the article that, hey, this is the population mean, or this is the population percentage. They don't really tell you that they got that data from the sample. So they didn't got, did not get that, that uh, population parameter. It's actually just a sample statistic that they're telling you is the estimate of the population parameter. So this is, it's always better to tell that to you in the article. They should say, hey, this is our, this actually came from sample data, and this is how we're estimating the population parameter. But we in the stat world know that there's going to be a margin of error. That sample statistic is going to be off from what the actual population parameter is. So what do we do? If we have one random sample, and that's the real world, all you got, and if you're lucky, you got one random sample, right? Hopefully unbiased. Hopefully it doesn't have a lot of bias in it. Then what can we do? Well, we know that the sample statistic is not going to be the population, so how can we figure out the population? Well, we can create something called a confidence interval. Confidence intervals were created for just this purpose, to take a one random sample and say something about the population. Now again, the principle of sampling variability indicates we're not going to know exactly what the population is from that sample. But we can make a confidence interval. So here's a big definition. Remember everything in stats is all about vocabulary, right? Got to know the definitions of things and how things work. A confidence interval is two numbers we think a population parameter, should have an R on that end there, there we go, parameter, might be in between, okay? So two numbers we think the population parameter might be in between. So in other words, I don't know what the population weight is, but I think it's between 25 kilograms and 29 kilograms. I don't know what the population percentage is, but I think it's somewhere between 3.5% and 5.8%, right? Two numbers that you think the population could be in between. That's the idea of a confidence interval. Now, um, in terms of calculating the confidence interval, what they use, the kind of the standard formula that's often used is to start with the sample statistic and then add and subtract the margin of error. So we said the margin of error is how far off we think the sample statistic could be from the population. So if we go ahead that distance from the sample, then that gives us the sort of two numbers that we think the population is in between. Okay, so there's a very standard formula. This formula does not always work. Um, it's used in certain circumstances. Uh, one of the main things is you sort of need a normal or at least symmetric sampling distribution for really this to work. So a lot of these formulas, again, are be tied to um, some of those same uh, areas that we studied when we studied central limit theorem, especially for means and proportions. Uh, we have to have certain things have to happen for this to work. Um, but one thing they indicate that's in, in, interesting when you're dealing with confidence intervals is that they come with what we call a degree of confidence or a confidence level. I like to call it a confidence level. Um, and they're usually 90%, um, 95%, or 99% confident. I know it would be kind of weird to say, I am 13% confident. Right? I don't think that's going to work. Right? People are going to look at you funny. I'm 27% confident. Now, usually uh, it's, it's a high confidence level, like 90, 95, 99. You might ask, well, why can't you be 100% confident? Well, it's really hard to be 100% confident about anything when you're talking about millions of people in a population. Okay? So you're never really going to be 100% confident. Um, all right. The one thing about these confidence levels is we use them in the sentence when we explain it, but this is really has to do with how the calculation is. This actually changes the critical value that's used in the calculation of the margin of error. So when, you, when we say confidence levels, we're not really talking about being confident, like a subjective confidence. 
it's this is math actually this is this is telling us how the formula is changing how the numbers in the formula is changing uh, depending on what confidence level we use uh, later we'll see that these these confidence levels uh, are often tied uh, to something called significance levels and type 1 and type 2 errors but we'll get into that later just remember that usually it's 95%. So if you ever get a confidence level, a confidence interval, and somebody didn't tell you what confidence level was used, it's usually 95%. Once in a while they'll use a 90 or a 99, but 95 is the one they use most often. So let's look at a quick example. We said that the calculation was the sample statistic plus or minus the margin of error. So if I knew the margin of error, now again, that's a that's a big if, right? We need actually. As the formulas for estimating margin of error can get pretty sophisticated. Uh, but let's suppose that we know the margin of error. The computer's calculated it for us. So, so let's take a look at this. Um, I looked at some the human body temperature. This was a random sample of 50 adults. Um, I got it off a of stat key. And um, I calculated, uh, I actually calculated the uh, mean and the margin of error. Um, and uh, I got this, 98.260 degrees Fahrenheit was the sample mean, and the margin of error was 0 0.218 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is quantitative data, human body temperature. I used a 95% confidence level because that's the most common. Okay. By the way, if you change that level, this margin of error would change. So just to be aware. So let's take a look now at how we calculated it. The plus or minus just means plus or minus, right? It just means you're going to add and subtract them. So if you subtract them, 98.26 minus 0 0.218, you're going to get 98.042. That's called the lower limit of the confidence interval. 98.26 plus 0.218 gives us 98.478. That's called the upper limit of the confidence interval. Two numbers that I think the population mean average are in between. The sample mean was 98.26, but that does not tell me that the population mean is 98.26. It actually tells me that the population mean could be anywhere between 98.042 and 98.478. That's